I saw this picture on the internet the other day. It obviously reminds us of Jurassic Park, but this is actually real. Uh, this is a gnat that is inside of a piece, a, an amber, Baltic amber, that's tree resin that's been petrified. And they say this is 40 million years old. Now, what fascinates me about this, and this is kind of maybe me, maybe not you, but when I look at this, I feel like I'm looking back in time. And you just see the details of the eyes and all this kind of stuff. It's just been frozen right there in time. And to look at it just sort of fascinates me. It's like you just take this kind of journey back in time, 40 million years, and it shows you that we're part of this longer old story. And in some sense, when I saw this, I, I, I thought, you know, that's kind of like what the Bible is. The Bible is this look like looking back in time. It's been preserved. If you're reading the New Testament, these books were written 2,000 years ago in the ancient Greek language, and you know it's been translated directly into English by Greek scholars. It's not been translated from one language to the next over the 2,000 years. Anybody who says, like, like the telephone game, if anybody thinks that, that is not historically accurate at all. The English translation you have now comes directly from the ancient Greek, and we have these thousands of copies that go back almost 2,000 years. The Old Testament, written anywhere from 24 to 3,400 years ago, written in ancient Hebrew, and the same thing translated into English. And it's like, if you just think about it, it's kind of, you're going back in time and you're reading somebody's mail. And the case of Ephesians, when you read the book of Ephesians in the New Testament, you're reading a letter that was written 2,000 years ago. You're reading it just like it is, translated into English, if you want to try to read it like it is in the Greek, you can. But in the English, you're reading the translation, and you're reading a letter from somebody who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, along with, the New Testament says, over 500 other people. And that, re that appearance of the resurrection of Jesus to this apostle Paul changed his life so much, he was convinced it changed the world, it can changed, actually changed everything, that he spent the rest of his life traveling to proclaim the resurrected Jesus. And because he wouldn't stop proclaiming the resurrected Jesus, he was eventually executed for it. If you could read that letter, 2,000 years old, kind of going back in time, almost like looking at a 40 billion year old gnat, looking at a 2,000 year old letter and reading what this person has to say who spoke to the resurrected Jesus. And when you think about it like that, the Bible all of a sudden is not this boring religious book and who knows who wrote it and who knows how we got it. It all of a sudden becomes very real and, and very personal. And, and it's telling us when you read this 2,000-year-old letter to the Ephesians that we're, we're, we're still inside this old story. It's a story that our lives are still inside. If we could just really get that, that we didn't, you know, life didn't begin when you were born. You're inside of an old story, and this letter is telling you what this person was convinced because of the resurrection of Jesus that this story is. And it's, I think, really super true to the human condition. In fact, the, the, the human condition is also a sign, this universal human condition is a sign that we're part of this old story. And even things, even though we have new technologies and you'd think we'd be better, there's signs that we're not, not really. For example, I saw this on Twitter the other day. It's one of these memes that goes around, and it was a tweet that said, me, when I first joined Twitter, versus me now. And there's something about it that captures kind of what what happens when we get involved, when, when the whole world, think about it this way, when the whole world, when humanity has the worldwide power to influence everyone else, well, it has the potential for good, but I think what we've seen is that it also has the potential for bad, maybe more bad than good. I mean, just the, just the, the self-righteousness and the bullying and the divisiveness and the luring into destructive behavior and the slander that takes place. And the, it just is one of these things that I think we would say at least it does as much bad 
as it does good, but I think it's a sign that there's this universal human condition that has been part of this old, old story that even though we develop new technologies, not much really changes when it comes to human nature. And I think in some way, Twitter kind of shows us a little bit of what the Apostle Paul is talking about in the first three verses of Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. But here's the thing. When we get into Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, the language is really strong. And you, you could tell the Apostle Paul is writing this letter and language won't do it. He can't quite find the words. He's trying to use as much language as he can to communicate what he's convinced is true because of the, resurrection, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so he says this, he starts off this way, and he says, as for you, now the you here is, he said in chapter 1, verse, the very first verse, he says, to those who believe in Christ. And so this is, he's talking to those who believe in Christ. This is a really hardcore passage, but it's a really hardcore passage because of the amazing passage that's going to follow that we're going to look at after we just take a quick look at this. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. Dead in your transgressions and sins is going all the way back to the first chapters of the Bible. When God told Adam if he eats from the tree that he told him not to, he will surely die. He did. He was kicked out of Eden. He and Eve were kicked out of Eden. They couldn't eat from the tree of life and live forever. And so they died and everybody since has died. And this sort of this plan to live forever is on hold. And there's been nothing but death ever since. Death being dead in your transgressions and sins. Now, you might think that after thousands of years of human history, we would get used to death and it wouldn't seem so strange. It would just be what is. Yeah, you live and you die and it's just what is. And yet, I don't think anybody ever gets to that point. If we were just a material being in a material universe, I don't think, I think we would be fine with what is, but we always have this sense of ought. Is is not ought. We have an ought that comes from somewhere else. And I think it comes because we were created to not be dead in transgressions and sins. And I experience that feeling every time I read obituaries. I don't look for obituaries, but they're often in papers I read when somebody famous dies. For example, yesterday when I was reading the Wall Street Journal, a couple famous people, well, I don't know who they are, but they were kind of noteworthy people who died. One person who became this you know, gazillionaire in Silicon Valley because of just making good bets, and he had all this you know, success because of it. Another person who died is a statistician who developed new ways of data and things like that. Now, these are all things that none of us probably care a whole lot about. But when I was watching this, I couldn't help but have this, you know, reading this, sorry. I couldn't help but have this sense, wow, when you think about it, these pictures of these people, go back to that one before if you can, these pictures of these people, they're just sort of really happy with their success, and they have done incredible accomplishments, and now they're dead. I mean, they're gone. And not to get too heavy and not to get too poetic, but it really does make you think that no matter what you achieve in life, no matter what rewards you get, no matter how much notoriety you get, no matter how much approval you get, recognition you get from people, no matter how many success rewards you get and all the hopes in your life and joys in your life, it, it all comes to nothing when you die. The greatest all become the same, and that's nothing that dead in your trespasses and sins is sort of this tragedy of the human condition that we still kind of sense. And we can't just, it's not just it is what it is. And he says, dead in your trespasses and sins, and you're following the ways of this world. And we kind of see an example of that, like I said, on, on social media. But it even gets worse. Again, this is really strong language. Just stick with me. He says then in verse 2, it's going to get even stronger. He says, and you're following not just the ways of this world, not just dead in your trespasses and sins, but you're following the ruler of the kingdom of the air. This, 
what the Bible calls elsewhere, well, he'll actually say in chapter 6, the kingdom of darkness. And this kingdom that's of the air, you can't see it, it's spiritual. There's a ruler of the kingdom of the air, and he gives another description, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Now, this is kind of a, a weird verse because we don't really have commonly this worldview. We kind of go through life mostly with a materialistic worldview, even though we believe in God. For some reason, we find it hard to believe in spiritual beings. I don't get the logic of that, but that's just because we, the water we drink, the air we breathe, it's just our culture. But the Bible has this worldview that, that our, our disobedience and our following, the ways of this world, our trespasses and sins are being energized by, a spirit, by spiritual beings of a dark kingdom that we can't see. This word at work in, the Greek word is the word where we get the English word energized. That, that, that the spirit, the ruler of the kingdom of the air is energizing. Energizing our trespasses, energizing our disobedience, energizing the ways of this world that just go from, from what could be good to bad. But then notice what the Apostle Paul does. This is the last hardcore verse. He says this in, chapter, in verse 3. He says, all of us, including himself, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Now, when the, let me just say this real quick because I think it helps something make sense. When the New Testament uses this word flesh, the Old Testament, this is not the case. The Old Testament word flesh just means our body. But when the New Testament uses the word flesh, usually, what it means is legitimate needs and desires of our body that have, that have been disordered, deformed, misdirected to become ultimate. So what would be a normal desire for something becomes an ultimate desire that, that becomes a, a craving that, that makes me a slave of the immediate. I have to satisfy that now. Cravings are different than longings. We're created with these longings. Longings are good. Longings, that's kind of right in the word, long. long has, longings have this long view that there are these needs that I have that I have a hope to have fulfilled in something in the future. I'm not going to become a slave to the immediate. I'm not going to sacrifice what is the, the longing for somehow sacrificing a craving. A craving is a, a desire that's been misdirected. It's been deformed. It's been somehow distorted, and it's making me live for the now, and I become my own worst enemy. We all know what that's like. We all know what it's like to be driven by cravings, and even when we're being driven by cravings and we're doing the cravings, we know that it's a destructive choice that we were our own, our own worst enemy. Here's what Paul's saying. Here's what we, he says, those who are in Christ, here's what, and you were and we were. He's saying we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were by nature objects of wrath, deserving God's judgment. What he's not saying necessarily that we were are people who are disobedient and have trespasses and sins. And he doesn't say that. And if you read the rest of the letter of the Ephesians, he talks about the reality of that. In fact, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he says about himself in the present tense, he says, I am the foremost of sinners. In the present tense. Not I was, but I am. What was, was being dead in trespasses and sins. What was, is being an object worthy of God's judgment. But the reality of cravings versus longings and the, the being our own worst enemy is what he's talking about in this entire letter. And here's what he says on how to, how to, have, that, how to have a mindset that helps us not be driven by cravings, but instead be people who live for longings. Here's what it is. And he can't quite find the words, but he's gonna do his best Verse 4, but God. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We're following the ways of the world. We're being energized by spiritual beings who want nothing but our destruction. And so we're driven by cravings and we become our own worst enemy and we're deserving of God's judgment. But God. But God being, and he's trying to find the words, God being rich 
in mercy. How do you say that? How do you say that in a transcendent way? How do you say it in a way that's so amazing because he knew it was so amazing because he saw the resurrected Jesus and he knew what the whole point was of Jesus coming and dying and rising from the dead and the whole promise and he's trying to find the words, God, but, but God, us, us are, we are our own worst enemy, but God being rich in mercy because of the great Love. I mean, he can't even find the superlatives. The great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, when we were doing trespasses, even in that sorry state, that's when God loved us. That's when he was rich in mercy. That's when he was pouring out this great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. He goes on, by grace you have been saved. This word saved, I just want to say it again in case you're here for the first time. That doesn't mean die and go to heaven. Not in the New Testament, not in the Old Testament, not in the Bible it doesn't. It means healed. It's the same Greek word when it says Jesus healed somebody, it's the same Greek word. It means being restored to what God has originally intended us to be. This gospel of being saved means being born again in the sense that we've been made alive We've been, we have this resurrection when Christ comes back on a resurrected earth, when heaven comes back to earth, when he returns. So by grace, you've been saved and you've been raised up with him and seated with him in this promise of heaven coming back to earth in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages, now I don't even know what that means. In the coming ages, there's going to be coming ages. Okay, we got that. In the coming ages, he might show, now he's trying to find words again, the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And he says it again now. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here's here's what he's saying. Okay, it's really bad. But God, you're your own worst enemy. You know what that's like. But God. Yes, there's a ruler of the kingdom of the air and he is doing nothing but causing misery and nothing ever gets good, even though it has a potential for good. It always gets bad and it just seems hopeless. But God being rich in mercy, when the, with the great love with which he's loved you and this, this Im, immeasurable grace and kindness toward you, by grace you've been saved. It's a gift of God. It's not a result of your works. It's not anything you've done. You can't do it. You're this. But God. And so all God, because of his love in dying for you and rising from you by becoming human in the person of Jesus in Christ, he has already, I don't get it quite because I'm right here, but somehow already I've been raised because Jesus has been raised. I mean, in the timeline of God, Somehow in the future, God has made the future the past. These are all past tenses because it's just as good as done if I'm in Christ because this is true of Christ and I'm in Christ. I've already been made alive. I've already been raised with him. I've already been seated with him. You too, if you're in Christ. It changes everything. And and here's the thing, it's because of his great mercy and the riches of his grace and his love with which he loved us and this kindness in Christ. If we understand that, 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 here's the thing, that as much as Jesus has been made alive, as much as Jesus has been raised, as much as Jesus has been seated at the right hand of God, as much as Jesus is loved by the Father, as much as Jesus is accepted by the Father, is the same exact being accepted, being loved, being secure as you are if you're in Christ. See, the math of of this is that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. If you have Jesus, you have it all. All the righteousness of Jesus is given to you because you're in Christ. 
All the love God has for him is given to you because you're in Christ. All the security of being completely accepted, completely belonging is yours because you're in Christ. Here's the thing. You can absolutely live like you're loved. Loved with a love that there's no superlative to be able to describe in the language of humanity. There's a, you can live knowing that all these longings you have are fulfilled, are going to be fulfilled. Now, they're all in the past tense because it's as good as done, but the future for us still, going to be fulfilled in Christ. They're longings. And so you don't have to live by cravings. You don't have to become a slave to the immediate. You can live for long, pursue longings because all your longings are fulfilled in Christ. Your longings to be loved for who you are. Your longings to belong forever to what, the people that really matter. Your longings for acceptance. Your longing for a life of significance, of worth. Your longing to have a life that means something, that has a purpose, that has a plan is all in Christ. If you would just believe what this, the Spirit of God is writing through the Apostle Paul, but it, it, it's by faith. You, you, you have to decide if you're going to believe it or not. And so he says this, that last verse, for, for we are his workmanship. His workmanship. He's the one doing it. He's doing the work. Created, he'll say newly created in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, a new creation. We're cr newly created in Christ Jesus for good works, not by good works. We're not, we don't, we're not saved by good works, but, but we are for good works, which, which God has prepared. God's done it. We're his workmanship, and, and he's prepared even the good works beforehand that we should just walk in them. Here's everything that it means is that... that God has prepared good works already for you to walk into. That, that your whole life is a work of God. Your whole life is God's workmanship. Now, I, I know that we don't get that because we have this sense that we're our own worst enemy and we have this sense of being weighed down by guilt and we have this sense of being hopelessly driven by cravings and that might be true, but the way out and not a complete way out this side of the resurrection no verse in the Bible says it is. But a way out of being driven by cravings to the immediate is to learn to live by our longings that are fulfilled in Christ. And we understand that our whole life is a workmanship. When, you, when, when the grace of God comes into your life, you discover everything about you is a work of God. The, the family you were born into, all the, all the tragedies in your life, the troubles in your life, the hardships in your life, the, the, the ethnicity, your ethnicity, your gender, your talents, your weaknesses, are all this workmanship of God for you in Christ because he's preparing beforehand good works for you to walk into. Good works in this life because he's got this story that is true of you that makes it so true that only you can do certain good works for somebody else. That there's good works that only you can do in this life. But what he said in verse 7, in the age to come, good works that God has prepared for you just to, to walk into. You can live like you're loved and understand that your longings are pointing to everything that this passage is about. And it's all true. You know it's all true because Jesus rose from the dead. If Jesus rose from the dead, it's all true. Everything Jesus taught is all true. Everything the Apostle Paul is teaching is all true. The whole thing, the whole Bible's true. If Jesus rose from the dead, and I believe that it's not 100% proof, but I believe the evidence is more plausible that he did. I've bet my whole life on it. The Apostle Paul, who saw him, bet his entire, literally, bet his entire life on it. And it's easy for these passages to become so familiar. They just go in one ear and out the other. I mean, it's all these words, but yeah, you know, you just heard it before, and the familiarity keeps you from hearing it fresh. 
So I asked a friend of mine, Michael, come on up here. I asked a friend of mine, Michael Porter, who's on our staff. He's on our ministry staff. You know, he did a few months ago Psalm 23, and it was just a kind of a fresh way, kind of a Michael Porter way of saying it that kind of helped, you know, make it fresh and something that I didn't catch before. Almost like I heard it for the first time. And I just said, hey, can you come up here in your track suit and, uh, and come up here? <laughs> And can you, can you just say Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, kind of in your own way? Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Gotcha. <clears throat> all right. So um, you all know that it wasn't that long ago that you were stuck, entangled in a life of stagnant, dead, going nowhere sin. You let the world which doesn't know the first thing about true life living, tell you how to live. I mean, you inhaled poisonous, polluted unbelief, and you exhaled disobedience. It almost seems nonsensical that God didn't lose his temper and just wash his hands of us totally and completely. But God, but God possessing mercy and love so immense that this universe doesn't have room to contain it. You know what he did? He pulled us in. He embraced us much to the chagrin of the principalities and powers that try to energize all our dark deeds. I mean, our adversary, Satan, he's sure enough going to regret it because you and me, we're no longer indebted. We got brand new life in Christ, and we got to give God the credit, every single drop of it. Now, God has us right where he wants us, with all the time in this world and the next to shower his people with grace and kindness. Kindness. This salvation he provides, it's not a reward for the good things we've done. None of us can boast about it. So the bottom line is this. You, me, we are all God's workmanship. We're his masterpiece. He has created us brand new in Christ so that we can go and do the good things that he planned long ago before the creation of this world. So go do good things, man. Do good things. Go. Do good things. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you. Um, Would you guys please stand to receive God's blessing? May the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you can know him better. Amen. Go and enjoy your Sundays, guys.